Hi, Kim students. We're going to talk about this new concept called Lewis dot diagrams. We've been spending a lot of time talking about the electron configurations and how important they are because they, they kind of fit the, the scheme of the periodic table and they also are, they also come about, if you look, they come about naturally from the quantum mechanical theory that describes the, the atom. So uh, before that was even done though, before the quantum mechanical model was done, uh, from about 1916 through 1919, uh, Gilbert Lewis started to look at the uh, concept of the electron and how important it might be for bonding and for chemical reactivity and made great headway during that time in bringing about a, a systematic way to approach and predict these types of properties uh, that may not be perfect and it may not be scientifically dead on, but it's very useful and to this very day people use these Lewis dot diagrams all the time to describe what atoms are kind of looking like, how they're going to bond, it's, 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 and then it, it'll become a bookkeeping method for us that'll be very, very useful. So you need to become pretty much an expert at this skill. So let's dive right in. The way you dive in and figure out how this all works is you start by looking at something like hydrogen, and all you do is you look at the electron configuration for it. So here's the electron configuration for hydrogen, it's 1s1. I've also done helium next, but then I've looked at lithium. Lithium's right below hydrogen on the periodic table, and if I look very carefully, lithium also has, in its very outer bit, the outer shell, has a 2s1 configuration while hydrogen has a 1s1. So we kind of saw that when we wrote the noble gas electron configuration that the outer shell was a 2s1. We do the same thing for sodium, which is right below, right below lithium, and which is right below hydrogen, and we notice that all three of these have this 1s1, 2s1, 3s1 configuration. That ends up being something that we would call an ns1 electron configuration. And they all have similar chemical properties. So therefore, this, this whole concept of Lewis dot diagram stems from the idea that these share the common outer bit of electrons, which we're going to call valence electrons. These valence electrons are the outer ones. And if they're the same, a lot of the chemical properties will be the same. Uh, we can see the same thing happening if we go over a, a little bit further on the periodic table to the right and we look at sulfur and oxygen. They both have, if you look at their outer, if you look at their outer valence electrons, they both have an NS2 NP4 electron configuration. And you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Well, now that we have this, Lewis and those guys thought this is going to be hard to write down all the time. And what we'd like to have is a picture of the atom that we could kind of play with, almost like a puzzle piece, uh, to, to go ahead and, and maybe try to fit things together to see how bonding works. So he, what he did was he said, let's take something like our sodium here, and let's take our sodium atom, and we'll draw its symbol, and then we'll put the number of electrons around it that it has. So it, number of valence electrons, not all of them, just the valence. And so this is a 3s1, that one tells us there's one electron, and so we would just draw the electron as a dot. Some people might use a little x, we might use an open circle. We'll do that when we talk about bonding so we can kind of differentiate where electrons come from, but for now, we're just going to use these plain old dots. So sodium and lithium and hydrogen all share this single dot as their electron, as their Lewis dot diagram. If we do oxygen, oxygen is going to have six around it. And the way we go about doing this is we, we kind of go in an order. We say one, two, three, four. Then we can put the other two wherever we want. One, two. Okay? Sulfur would be very similar. We, we would go one, two, three, four, five, six. And that would encompass the two and four, six total electrons around sulfur. So it has six valence electrons. We're going to put all six out there. Well, if you do this for the whole periodic table, you can really see, not the whole thing, but the S and the P block at the very least, you can see the consistency and why we ended up, uh, why the periodic table has its shape and how this all matches is, is pretty wonderful. So if you just look down here, here's, here's the NS2NP4 group, 
and it has six electrons around it. Uh, it it's, it's really wonderful how this worked out. Very easy to follow if you take a look at this. The question is, you know, can you get to where you can just draw these directly from an electron configuration or from looking at the periodic table? That's your goal. Can you draw one of these and use them? So a little note for you. Lewis diagrams, they're not really real. They're, they, they're a way to account for where the electrons are, how many we have, and it's a way to look at bonding in a, in a very a very orderly manner. However, it's not really true. This is just a useful tool. Electrons aren't little dots. There are, are they're waves and particles all at the same time. It's a lot more messy than that. The key thing is this is a, a tool that works and we want to use tools that work. So as we talk about these electron dots, the question is, was oxygen, was that the only way I could draw an oxygen? You know, so when we put those dots around there, is there, a, is there a way to put them that's definite? And the answer is no. I showed you kind of a, a pattern that we could use, but that doesn't mean we're going to always have that pattern. So let me kind of show you a few examples that will clear this up for you. So if we look at carbon, carbon is going to have one, two, three, four electrons because carbon is an NS2, NP2 type of atom. So look on the periodic table and see if you can figure that out. Uh, in particular, carbon is going to be 2s2, 2p2. All right, so in an atom, you would draw carbon in this way. But when we see carbon in molecules, it's going to be, an, uh, we're going to see it form and put its electrons in a lot of different manners. So we could see what we just talked about. We could see exactly that. But we may also see carbon do something like this, where it puts two of them together and then has two of them that are not together. Or it could put two like that. And by the way, you could draw that same one that we just did this way or this way. There is no true rule that says here's how you must do it. And finally, there's one other way that carbon every so often will show up. And it will be where we put three on one side and one on the other. So there's lots of ways when carbon's in a molecule that will be portraying these electrons. We kind of imagine them moving around when they're not really doing so, um, but it, it, once again, it's a useful tool. Same thing can be done for oxygen. Oxygen is, is normally drawn as one, two, three, four, five, six, as we did before, but we'll see it lots of times, most of the time drawn in this fashion in a molecule where we put two up above and one on each side, or we'll put all of them in pairs, all six electrons in pairs. So this is just another thing that people do, and we'll see these pop up. So don't get stuck on this being the only way to draw it. Those electrons are not fixed in any way, shape, or form. So one last thing to finish up our, our concept of the Lewis diagram for atoms, what do we do if we have something that is an ion? What are we gonna do about an ion? So if we look at lead, PB, uh, that one ends up being a, two, uh, uh, not a two, but an NS2, 2P2, just like carbon. Not a 2P2, I'm sorry, an NP2. So that's what, it's gonna have four electrons around it if it's lead. One, two, three, four. If it becomes lead two, we want to tell people that it's, first off, we got to tell people that it's an ion, uh, but what happens when you're a positive two ion is you lose electrons. They become positively charged, you lose the negative part. So that would mean two of those electrons would be gone. So you could just draw them across from each other. And then to tell people it's an ion, we, we probably want to put the B in there. Yep. Not very good. There we go. There we go. That's now it's lead, not phosphorus. So we put brackets around it, by the way, at the very end here, and we put the charge there to tell people that we've got an ion. So if we had something like a an oxygen ion that was positive, an oxygen plus, we would draw the regular oxygen. We'd put its six electrons around it. And then we'd say, wait a second, it lost an electron. You could pull any electron off, put a bracket around it, and put a plus.
Now let's move on and talk about anions, these negative ions. And to get a to become a negative charge like this sulfur right here, you would need to gain two electrons. So if we think about sulfur, it's going to be an NS2 NP4, as we saw earlier. And the sulfur atom looks something like this. I think that's how we drew it a little earlier. So this particular thing, this, this sulfur, to become sulfide, it actually gets two electrons added to it. And we would draw those electrons all paired up with eight around it. So eight seems to be kind of a magic number we're going to find as time goes on. To make sure everyone knows it's an ion, we put a bracket around it and we tell them the charge. So there you have it. Here's how we make um, Lewis diagrams for atoms. And this is the first step in doing Lewis diagrams for molecules, which is the subject of our next video.